Hello everyone, my name is Benjamin Herford. I'm giving a talk about the evolution of humanitarian mapping within the OpenStreetMap community. I'm a bit excited, so yeah, I'm having a small audience here in my, my flatmate, so let's see how this goes. I have to like get some yeah, energy, so I have still a beer left from last year's conference, so yeah, I can enjoy that. Um, but the work that I present here is not only my work, it's the work of many people, so Special thanks to my colleagues in Heidelberg, Martin, Jochen, Alina and Marcel and all the others. Mm. All the graphics and figures you will see in these presentations are also available online at the website listed down. Yeah, and um, let's start. Um, what we've been interested in is what has happened during the almost like 10 years of humanitarian mapping in OpenStreetMap. Where did it happen and when did it happen? And for this analysis, we use OpenStreetMap data and we use the OSHDB, the OpenStreetMap History Database. That's a high performance spatial temporal data analysis platform for OpenStreetMap data, obviously, and developed here by colleagues at Hygit. And we use the data from the tasking manager that has been provided by the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team. And our approach is to combine those data sets using the so-called OSHDB contribution view. And based on this, we can analyze all edits that happened in OpenStreetMap based on the so-called sessions, I will define that later, in the task manager. So basically, we can look at every geometry or every task that has been mapped in the task manager, look when a user started to work on it and finished working on it, and by yeah, using the OSM user ID, we can match this to the respective contributions directly in OpenStreetMap. Okay, um, just want to give you some background also on the terms that we are going to use in the following. So for the ones of you that are not familiar with humanitarian OpenStreetMap, task manager and so on, just a brief um, introduction. So let's start in the middle. At the task manager, there are so-called projects. Usually they consist of an area of interest that should be mapped. There are some instructions that tell you what you should map, which imagery you should use, and so on. And a project is usually set up by an organization. That could be a local OSM community or like an international humanitarian organization. And then for each project, this large area is divided into many smaller tasks that are usually squares. There are some projects that do not use squares, but most of them do. Finally, the users, so the people using the task manager, work on individual tasks. And when this happens, so the combination of a user and a task is what we call a session. So this should give you the basic um, yeah, reference points here. Just to mention, for tasks in the task manager, there are different states. So the most common ones are either mapped or validated. It's like this, that first the task gets mapped and then in a second round, another user looks at the same area and validates all the data that has been added or contributed to OpenStreetMap. Okay, this is about the task manager. And now let's take a look at the OpenStreetMap data. I already mentioned it. We take a look at the full history of OpenStreetMap. So all the contributions and all edits that happened since the very beginning, I brought you an example here, T1 refers to timestamp 1, T2 to timestamp 2, so we have two points in time, and between those two, things have changed in OpenStreetMap, so users did some edits. The easiest case, we start on the left side, is the creation. So basically, if you or someone adds, for example, a building, as listed here, to OpenStreetMap, this would be a creation. So new data is added. There has not, not, this building has not been an OSM before. Another change that we can see from the data is a tag change. That's what we have on the, yeah, where the highway is marked. So the geometry of the highway, the highway itself was already present. So it has been added at some previous time, not listed here. But now from T1 to T2, some user changed the tag, so the description of that specific highway. It was marked as unclassified for T1, and now it's marked as residential. 
So this is what we refer to as a tag change. Another um, type of change would be the geometry change. So look at the waterway. You obviously see that the geometry of it changed between the two timestamps and that could be either, like most of the cases, it's because you either move a node or you can, like for, like you can move nodes, so that will infer geometry change. And for ways and relations, you can also add or remove nodes. Okay. And the last um, type of change or thing we can see in the OpenStreetMap history data is a deletion. Also fairly simple to understand. It's in the easiest case here, just the object, another example here, the building has been removed from the OpenStreetMap database. This is a bit a simplification. There are some edge cases um, that I will not go into many more details here. If there are questions, we can address that later, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, but now um, let's come back to our initial question. So we have now have like the basic uh, concepts and uh, terms here. But now let's really look at what happened, when did it happen, where did it happen. So the map, or I will show you a short video in a minute, um, shows you all the locations where projects in the task manager uh, have been created. And the size of the dots that you are seeing here already, and you will see it in the video as well, shows the activity. So how many sessions, how many users worked on tasks per project. And for the specific example, we counted all the sessions where a user marked something as being mapped. Um, so let's shift here. Okay. So what we see, basically, it starts in 2012. We go on and it's the first thing you can see, okay, from 10 years ago to today, the amount of projects increases a lot and the overall mapping also increases. So, and let me stop it here for a second. Mm. I can also go a bit back. So usually you, or you are maybe aware of um, the events that happened in the past. So if we go back to 2013, that's when the, the um, typhoon in the Philippines happened. Um, that was the first um, major disaster activation. We clearly see it in this data here. Before that, we had some projects in Central Africa mainly. If we go on, um, we see from mid of 2014, West Africa, the Ebola outbreak caused a lot of uh, response activity and mapping there. So it's somewhere here. Um, we follow the line, we see 2015, May, April, Nepal earthquake, but maybe just to mention here already, it's not only activations anymore. We see many other projects being active at the same time, although there is a major disaster activation. And this goes on now um, for the um, following uh, years and months. And basically we see that South America gets more and more mapped and in general also from the geographical distribution. It's not only in few countries and few regions, but task manager is used by a diverse community of communities for many different types and in many different locations. So this is the main takeaway that we can see here. And I didn't show you yet, but this is also backed by more organizations being involved in setting up projects. Um, so we can really kind of say that there is a global humanitarian OpenStreetMap community and that is what, what you can see from, from these animated maps here. Okay, um, let's quickly look at the user side. So um, we already seen there's a lot of activity and this goes along with more and more users being active in the task manager. So here we have the number of users per month that have been active uh, for, for mapping. So the users marked a task as being mapped. We clearly see again the major disaster activations 2013 Philippines, 2015 Nepal, um, Ebola, Irma, all the recent ones. And we see that how, how much the active mappers increased, but also how many new mappers per month join mapping in the task manager. So it's several thousand mappers starts using the task manager per month. 
And now quickly looking at the other side, the validation part, I already mentioned validation is the second step in that workflow. It's required that we are a bit more experienced. And here we see an interesting um, fact that it, for the first years it kind of is similar to the evolution of how the number of mappers increased. But since 2018-2019 we see that the number of users that validated the task was either steady or even the number was reduced a bit. So that would be interesting to further investigate why this was the case. And we now, for the year 2020, see an increase. So it will be interesting to, to monitor this further, um, what might be the reason for this. So I didn't look into it, but it might be the case that with a new task manager, um, it's easier for people to start validating than before. That would be a really good thing. Um, but need to be double checked. Okay, so far we only looked at the task manager data, so the activity where has been mapping happened, how many users have been active, but we didn't look at the OpenStreetMap data. That comes now. So now we use the OSHDB, we look at the OpenStreetMap history, and we see really what all those mappers have added to the map. And we will take a look at two. Um, Feature types, we will look at buildings and at highways, because that's what's mainly mapped by humanitarian mappers at the moment. So the dark blue line shows you the number of buildings that have been added by all OSM users since 2008. So we see that building mapping in OSM became a thing roughly around 2010, and since then till today users have added a bit more than 400 million buildings. These are the buildings that have been added, some have been deleted, so to get the, the, the number that is now present, you would have to um, yeah, subtract the deleted ones, but roughly 400 million buildings have been added to OpenStreetMap since then. And now we take a look at um, the other line that starts to grow only in 2015 or so, and that is the mapping of the buildings that have been added through the hot task manager. And we see that this has grown to a quite a big share of the overall um, buildings. So in 2020 again, we have roughly a bit more than 50 million buildings that have been added to the task manager. And that's it's around 12, 13% or so. So it's a huge impact that humanitarian mapping has on the OpenStreetMap data when it comes to buildings. One side fact here, um, my interpretation of this uh, curve is that this is mainly due to the efforts of the Missing Maps project. In 20, uh, 2015, Missing Maps, like it was started in 2014, but it really went off in 20, 2015, and since then many buildings have been contributed through the Missing Maps project. A side note again, Missing Maps in general accounts for around 60% of the activity in the task manager in total. So that has been regarding buildings. Let's now take a look at highways. For highways it's um, slightly different. So, okay, the general trend is clear. Highways are still being mapped in OpenStreetMap and there's still a big need we have to map more highways. The share of humanitarian mapping through the task manager is much lower here. It's around 2% in 2020. Um, you know, but still, 2% is a, quite also like a contribution, and we will see how this will evolve in the future, especially if it comes to like new approaches like using assisted AI, assisted mapping, and so on. Okay, let's quickly go to the challenges that we maybe some of you already noticed in the data that I presented. So first one, mapping versus validation. Ideally, every task that is mapped should also be validated. And this is what we can see at this figure here. It shows like the relative share of both. So if in one month, the same number of tasks gets validated and mapped, it would be 50-50. So um, both um, lines would be just equal. 
Um, but it's not the case, obviously, and that's also what we what we kind of know. But this shows us quite um, nicely, in my impression, that we do the mapping activities are much more than validation activities, and this is a problem if we know that many beginners. Um, R mapping and validation would be an important step towards like having good data quality. Um, so we are going to use this uh, approach as a figure in the future to see how new efforts towards better validation will like, perform and see if if we can get like closer to the equilibrium line and see that um, yeah everything that gets mapped is also validated. But it's still a challenge. Another one I want to mention is user retention and contribution imbalance. So user retention means in this specific case for the task manager that 70% of the users of the task manager map only for a single day. And it's around 4% of the users that are active for more than 10 days. It's to a certain degree that's normal for any crowdsource project as OpenStreetMap is as well. But ideally, we would make sure that more users come back and map more days than only once, also to, to improve their contributions. That's on the one side. Um, on the other hand, the, like the um, distribution of who does how much work, it's this, this Lorentz curve on the, on the right hand side. So this shows us again that especially for validation, most of the work is done by only a few people for validation. It's around 90% of the work is done by 10% of the users only. And it's not as extreme for mapping. And here again, I would say this is kind of a, an idea that we need maybe other strategies towards validation, validation, because if more and more tasks get mapped, we also need more people that get involved in validation. And the few ones that are active already might not be able to handle this anymore. Okay, um, I'm not sure how much time I have left, probably not too much. Um, so let's have a quick outlook here and put the things that we've seen now into, into the context. And I tried to come up with a rough overview here and I'm happy to, to hear your thoughts on that and to add more things that I probably missed. So on the top we have the mapping activities. These are the ones that I already mentioned, uh, mapping for Typhoon Haiyan, Nepal Earthquake, Hurricane Matthew, and, and so on and so forth, um, that we clearly see in the data. But another thing that we, we already touched a bit is which organizations are involved in mapping. HOT has been founded in 2010 already, but we've seen an impact of the Missing Maps project. We could look deeper and we might also find impact of other groups and communities like use mappers. Um, I didn't look into how the corporates are being active, but there would be many more dimensions here, which organizations become active in OpenStreetMap. Um, the tools itself might have an impact, how many people can validate, um, how easy is it to use and contribute data to OpenStreetMap that starts with a task manager, but also like the general OSM tools like the ID editor, or yeah, other tools like Mapswipe or Rapid Editor and so on. Mm. Imagery I listed as well. So when Bing, Bing imagery became available, this had a big effect on mm, yeah, remote mapping. And we see um, like open area map, but also mapillary, mapillary street level images like contribute to new types of mapping we haven't seen before. And last but not least, um, maybe put everything into the big context, especially humanitarian mapping also acts um, like often in regards to the bigger frameworks such as the Sustainable Development Goals, the Zendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction or the Paris Agreement. And um, all the things that I unfortunately couldn't look into detail for this talk, but I'm happy to, to work on in the next couple of months. Yeah. Mm, this was my talk. Um, thanks for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions now. <laughs> yeah. um, cheers.
Thanks a lot, Benjamin, uh, for this great uh, uh, work. Uh, as usually, the Heidelberg team is showing us something great. Um, and also, uh, while uh, listening and looking at the stream, um, I, I really uh, I really thought that we should probably take this opportunity also to thank all the people and all the volunteers and all the mappers that over uh, so many years have contributed to the uh, to the to the contribution of mapping data through the uh, task manager, which uh, I think it's, it's something really uh, extraordinary and that we should really um, recognize. So um, there's uh, there's been uh, quite some activity in the in the pad. Uh, so I'm happy to uh, read the first uh, question. Uh, I see people that are still writing uh, questions, which is great. So the first one um, is, is this one. Uh, so how do you determine if a building or a highway is a contribution uh, done by the hot task manager? So are there tags at the data? For example, in the change set comments that you are looking at, uh, maybe you said it and I missed this part of information. This is from Suzanne. OK, shall I go? Nice. Um, hey everyone, I'm Benny from Heidelberg. Um, thanks to Susanne for, for that question. So um, we do it like differently than what has been done before often. So many analysis has been based on change set and change set comments. We are um, not using this. So we are getting from the task manager the task, so the geometry. We get the user, the OSM, the OSM user ID and we get the time. So whenever you start or end working on that specific task. And with this information, we can query the OSHDB. So we are not looking for missing maps tags or hot OSM tags in a change set, but only geographic region user and time. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Benjamin. We have an, a second question that is uh, uh, similar because it's still on the um, on the methodology. So, how did you count mapping versus validation activities? Um, number of users, features, edits, uh, and this is from Serena. Th thanks, Serena, for this uh, question. Yeah, also a very good question, and um, let me make like clear what what this figure referred to. So in the one that I showed in the presentation, we compared the number of tasks that has have been mapped per month against the number of tasks that have been validated in that specific month. So it's not the users, but it's the amount of work measured in tasks or sessions. And we put that like the sum of both is 100%, and then we just have to share how much each has. And ideally, we would assume that 50% is the, the best number or close to it because everything every task that is mapped should also be validated but that's not what we have been seeing in the data the data clearly shows there's more mapping than validation yeah so it would be interesting to also look at the features but i guess that here you cannot easily compare because uh, we have to double check this again but Ideally, during the mapping phase, a lot of data gets added, and during the validation phase, it's maybe not so much, but it gets corrected. So comparing features will be interesting, but um, we'll show you a different thing. Thanks, Benjamin. I go to the next one that was actually asked by me, but I will take this for the end if we have time. Uh, so in the interest of really uh, hearing what the what the community has asked. So has your study show any impact on OSM mapping during the current pandemic? That is also another very interesting question from Serena. Um, that's a good question. Um, so. I, I cannot really say yes or no to this, unfortunately. So um, hmm, how, how to how to start on that? So um, we see that that there's a lot of mapping campaigns related to COVID nineteen, and we will also clearly see this in the data that gets produced by Task Manager and then ends in OSM. But at least for the analysis that we conducted so far, we did not. Um, took a more detailed look at the specific things only. We were more into looking at the overall trend, but it's definitely a good comment that we should um, like add in the future and see how like the current pandemic is visible in the data. Yeah. 
also to encourage the mappers and really show what has been done in the last month. Thanks, Benjamin. And once again, thanks, Serena, for this uh, question. I think we are all very uh, interested in understanding uh, how OSM was used in the pandemic and how much data was actually collected during the pandemic, especially because uh, the pandemic has developed and is still developing in a different uh, way uh, throughout the world. So it's definitely uh, a very fruitful ground for, for further research. Um, so next question, uh, are you aware of studies or have possibly conducted one yourself investigating possible differences regarding mapping behaviors between humanitarian mappers and ordinary mappers, also beyond specific actions or tasks? And are hot mappers mapping different kinds of features in possibly different ways? This is from René, and thanks, because this is also very interesting. Yeah, also, like, many good questions here. I'm, I'm happy about that. Um, so, yeah. Um, I think we are definitely sure that ordinary mappers and humanitarian mappers will add different things to the map. Um, and this would, like, mainly what I could present to you was more or less, unfortunately, only the data preparation part, so to say, of everything. So we I can throw a lot of numbers, descriptive numbers at you, but there would be much more needed to to, to go to the questions that, that René has been asking. Um, but definitely, so we only looked at highways and buildings. So there we see a clear impact of what has been mapped in the task manager. And we would like to extend this to other attributes or keys in, in OSM. But I'm pretty sure that we won't see as much activity there. Um, so going into to those details to also set the community that is mapping through the task manager in perspective to everyone else mapping through other tools uh, will be like a, an important next step for this analysis. Um, so ideally, what, what I have in mind is first thing is starting on a geographic um, spatial like distribution and see where is the remote mapping community most active in terms of the overall mapping activity. Yeah, not sure if that's a clear answer, but um, I hope that I can give a clearer answer in the future then. Yeah, that would be very, very interesting, I think, as a future uh, work. Um, next question. Um, it was sort of implied by the numbers and the graphs uh, you have shown, but that was not exactly formulated as such. Would you conclude that initiatives like HOT and Missing Maps are successful drivers for mapping participation? That was asked by Yagura Station. Mm -hmm. Um, so, okay, easy answer, I would say yes. So th um, we see that a lot of people start mapping in the task manager and a, lot, uh, a big part or share of that people, uh, mappers that start, start within a missing maps project. So that's for the mapping activity part. Okay. We also showed that starting is one thing, but sustaining uh, map contributions over a longer time is much more difficult. So I would say that all initiatives like Missing Maps are really good at attracting new mappers to join, but still, like people are doing a lot of efforts already, but still even more effort should be put into like having users contributing longer or finding new ways how to engage with users on a longer uh, time scale. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Benjamin. Uh, we have another question. Um about the um, yeah about which tasking manager you have actually considered. So the question is, uh, have you included several tasking managers used for humanitarian purposes? For example, the hot tasking manager from Indonesia or the tasking manager of uh, Legiograph Libre, sorry for my French, that is basically yeah, I, I, the Francophone movement, or is it only an analysis of one tasking manager that is the hot tasking manager? Yeah, also good to, to be clear on this. So we only use the data that or the projects that you see at tasks.hotosm.org. So what he is called the principal hot task manager. And we didn't consider all the other instances that, that are there. We are aware that there are many instances and that they also contribute a lot of data to OpenStreetMap probably, but we couldn't um, take this data into account here. And maybe this also points to maybe one major limitation of what I could present to you here is that what 
what we we oversimplified relatively sure what humanitarian mapping is. We only took at what mapping happens in the task manager. And we know that there are other task managers and there are many local mapping activities we could not analyze with this approach here, at least not with the data from the task manager. Yeah, thanks a lot for the question and also for the for the answer. As a matter of fact, we all know that the Tusky Manager is an open source software, and of course, this facilitates it, its reuse. Uh, not only in the examples mentioned in the questions, but I think uh, overall across the world, this is highly used by local uh, communities, as you have just uh, said. I can just mention the case of the Italian uh, earthquake of 2016, uh, given that I come from Italy and I remember that we use also the Tusky Manager to facilitate uh, a collaborative mapping after that uh, earthquake. So yeah, definitely uh, everyone can use the Tusky Manager and this might be a limitation of the study, although I, of course, many of your results, I think, give a quite clear picture um, of the mapping activity, especially the evolution over time in the number of objects that were mapped. I think this uh, is a valid result, um, uh, yeah. So, uh, well, there are a couple of questions that I asked in the chat. I think we still have a couple of minutes, so I will go with the first one. Um, I, I know that the uh, the OSHDB framework um, was created by the Heidelberg team in, or, in order to facilitate uh, uh, performing OSM history-based analysis by non-developers, because working with the history is not definitely an easy task for, for everyone, including also researchers. Um, I was wondering if you have an idea of how many people uh, have used it or are currently using it, mainly from uh, research uh, centers, universities, or local communities. That's a tough question. Um, I'm not sure if I have a good answer to that. Um, I know that at least yeah, in, in Heidelberg, we almost use it for every project we are doing because we are also like, through the projects, we are building the tool further and further. I I know about, I think the talk um, we heard before in, in the project um, from Drow and his group, they also used uh, the OSHDB for some parts of, of their work, at least to, to get the historical um, evolution of OSM. And yeah, besides this, maybe I, I should um, like ask Alex to send a tweet about that. Um, and give us uh, the actual uh, numbers. I hope that it's used by many people and um, could also encourage you to to use it. Basically, we have, like, for the non-developers, the easiest endpoint is the so-called Awesome API. It's like just a REST API. And what we used here was a bit more complicated because we used OSH to be, like, directly. And there you have to, like, code in Java. So that might be a bit not so non-developer friendly as just using an uh, API. Yeah. Thanks, Benjamin. And of course, I can only recommend to use it, uh, really, if you need to make uh, a history-based analysis of the data set. Um, yeah, so last question, again, it was from me. Uh, it was a general question on whether this study uh, started because it was asked by the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team uh, if yes, maybe why? Uh, if no, uh, did you share the results with them and did you get any feedback from them? Um, yeah, thanks for that question as well. So, um, so yeah, I can give you like a, a short story of this maybe. So we've been involved in the Missing Maps project for the last couple of years. And as one contribution that we wanted to give to the project is like better understand what Missing Maps is actually doing. So we were only taking a look at missing maps. We had the poster on missing maps last year at State of the Map. And when working on this, we soon realized, OK, we are also missing quite a lot that happens outside missing maps. So that's why we said, OK, let's do it a bit like bigger and the full picture. And then we also discussed it with HOT already. So that like these numbers we produce here, of course, they are also interesting numbers to write in any proposal for for funding or long-term funding that you can really show what has been your impact over the last couple of years. And so, yeah, we are in close contact with, with people from the humanitarian open street map team on this also to, to see how we can move this in the future to, yeah, what this was here now was like just a one shot activity, but ideally we will have this sustained over the next couple of months and years to come into the monitoring phase to really see how different mapping 
approaches really affect number of mappers, validators, OSM contributions, and so forth. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Benjamin. I think we completed the questions uh, that were asked in the pad. Uh, just uh, to conclude this uh, talk, I would like to thank the audience for being uh, active in the pad. 